All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I am joined by Holly Green, who is actually visiting the West Coast here. Uh, she's just up the road in Long Beach today. How are you doing, Holly? Very good, thank you. Gorgeous day here today. Yeah, and I am, as usual, down here in San Diego. And it's, well, it's a pretty fabulous day down here, too, <laughs> which is most days, let's face it. So um, today I'm really excited because uh, Holly is, we're going to talk about understanding how the brain really works. And uh, God knows I need to learn a little more about that. And using a technique called dis destination modeling to influence your potential clients much more effectively. And Holly, you have worked with, Navy SEALs, you've worked with professional athletes, you've worked with a, a lot of different people. So um, tell me a little bit about how the brain actually really works. Well, that would be a very long conversation. <laughs> and we only know, quite frankly, uh, mm -hmm. just the surface. You know, this is yeah. a dynamic and evolving space. We've really probably had to unlearn more about the human brain in the last decade than we've learned. Um, we're having to let go of a lot of those things we held on to for a long time as being absolutely certain or true. Um, but there are a few things we do continue to validate. And that is that the adult human is very easy to prompt or manipulate. Mm. And most of us are not doing it intentionally most days. So particularly when we think about sales, something yeah. that, that uh, we use in destination modeling, first of all, it's about getting crystal clear on what winning is. So mm. crystal clear first, and I mean with specificity. So not just, you know, we're going to offer you excellent service. We're the most responsive in customer care. You know, this is the best product. Um, really teasing apart so that it is as much as you possibly can, limiting the interpretation of your language. So mm. being very clear. So that's yeah. the first kind of piece of it. And then using what we call presumptive language. So speaking as if it is a given, when we are serving you incredibly well, when you are our most referenceable client, when we have exceeded your expectations. So presumptively as if there is no question or doubt that you will mm -hmm. achieve that. Yeah, and that's, that's interesting. Well, let me just uh, uh, focus in on both of those. Let's go back to the clarity piece because I, I think that's I think that's so fundamental because I do think that we often operate in in vagaries a lot right and we and as you say we kind of have these vague and broad outcomes that we're looking for right. or things that and and when you actually try to sit down and create clarity it can be quite a difficult process but it really does push all the nonsense aside in the end you're absolutely right and it is challenging and for some reason we don't want to invest the time and energy it does require on both sides of the table mm -hmm. pulling it out of your client or potential client mm -hmm. um and being able to state yourself you know not the features and benefits list that's the easy stuff right yeah <laughs> but really being able to define to listen in to what is most crucial to your client what is really the win to them and often it's irrational or illogical components of what you're offering. You sure? Yeah, and I think that's a great point because after all, I mean, we're, and I think that sometimes you forget, I mean, we're selling to humans, right? And you're not just selling to a company, you're often you're selling to a bunch of people and each of those people have, yes, they have company outcomes, they have strategic outcomes or tactical outcomes, but they also have their own personal outcomes. Right. Everyone wants to be a hero, do a great job. Mm -hmm. People want to be excellent at what they do. They want to deliver. Um, and so no one really wakes up in the morning and thinks, oh, I want to go to work and just suck today, right? Yeah, yeah. People exactly. Up, they want to do incredible things. Most days, though, most of us are running a different race than our colleagues and our boss. Okay? Yeah, We're that's running what we think is the race. Yeah, and that's very true. And I think that comes back to what you're saying about, you know, the, the clarity and the focus piece. And unfortunately, we live in this world today, I think, where it's getting harder and harder for people to to uh, create clarity and focus because we've got so much stuff coming at us. And as I always say, ad nauseum, I'm sorry to my audience. I apologize for repeating myself. But, you know, people all the time say, like, I'm, I'm busier than I've ever been. And I'm like, no, you're not. You're more distracted than you've ever been. 
Yes, and that is a great point. We do have more distractions. We have an exponential number of distractions today. And we have trained ourselves that busy or busyness is yeah. more important than results. So mm -hmm. busyness even trumps really survival today, which is a very interesting notion when you start teasing it apart. Um, and just several proof points. We'd never have a phone in our car if, if survival were really our prime driver. You know, right. start yeah. thinking about it for just a moment. So we, we have this notion that if we just go really fast, there'll be time to do it over, that it'll work out. But in fact, if you just take a breath, slow down. And I teach a lot of techniques that are 30 seconds, 30 seconds, because you can prompt your brain insanely easily. It loves when you visit. Right? <laughs> so there are a lot of great ways to prompt your brain to do exactly that, to slow down, to get clear and to speak in presumptive language. Mm -hmm. Most days we're talking about what we don't want. Um, right? what that's we don't very like, true. What just, we're not happy with. Yeah, I was just making a note of that, that idea of slowing down, because I just want to put a line under that one as well for people, because again, that whole idea goes against the pervasive culture of today and everything we're bombarded with. Oh, full speed ahead, fast, fast, fast. Taking that, taking, and you're saying like, 30 seconds sometimes is all you need or yeah. less. I mean, everybody can spare that surely. Um, but yeah, you're correct. The slowing down and then uh, the presumptive, the presumptive language, because uh, again, I mean, the language is very powerful and I think people sometimes underestimate, underestimate the power of the words yeah. that they use. Right. So yeah. if I say to you, like you were just saying, if I say to you, Holly, if we get your business, this is what we will do and everything. That that creates a different reaction than if I say, Holly, when we're working together, this is how it's going to be. Exactly. Or even to take that a little further. Yeah. Exactly. So when we're working together, let's talk about in what areas I've exceeded your expectations. Mm -hmm. How do we communicate most effectively? So it's that past tense, inserting mm -hmm. that. So it's speaking presumptively as if there's no doubt or question we will deliver and then doing it in the past tense because the fascinating thing about your brain is on many levels, it cannot and does not distinguish between real and imagined. Mm, that, and you cannot that, not answer a question. When I combine those two things, that's insanely powerful to manipulate people. <laughs> only for good, only for good. <laughs> only for good. Yeah, it's funny that you say that, though, because one of the things that a number of years ago, I was um, running another company and we were um, putting together simulations, right? Simulations for people to train and learn on uh, and learn on something. And when doing the research for that, you discovered that you're correct. The brain will recall a simulation as if it was an actual occurrence. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. distinguish. It's why scary movies work. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? It's the same concept. It's funny. We we know it in so many ways, um, but we don't really use it incredibly well at work. Yeah, absolutely. So getting into that, getting into that mode of speaking differently and using language differently, uh, you want, do you have to kind of train your brain to do that? Yes. For whatever reason, it is it is um, challenging for the adult human to do it. I'm not sure why. I spend I always tell me I spend about fifty percent of my time working with some of the most successful businesses and leaders in the world, but I'm pulling out of their head constantly. What is the win? Very specifically, because it's in there. But the ability to articulate it well is a challenge. It's an opportunity for most of us to get better at it. Um, part of this is because most of the mental models that we have were taught from a very early, early age and we're taught no much more than yes. Mm -hmm. And so we have a lot of these limiting constraints in our brain. We're very used to talking about what we don't want, why it won't work, why you're a stupid boss, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yeah. um, and so it's a, it's really about flipping that upside down. And sadly, because we have so many years of doing it from more the negative or limiting constraint perspective, those neural pathways are very, very deep. And you have the ability to create new pathways until your dad or your brain is diseased. You can do right. it, but it does require time and it does require intention. Yeah. So, and I think that's, that's the, I think again, those two points like time 
and intention because again as i said you know we live in this shortcut culture where everybody wants everything instantly and everything should be easy right i right. mean obviously to retrain a lifetime of maybe your your you know negative reinforcement as opposed to positive reinforcement or thinking no before yes i mean you do have to invest the time and it's hard i mean let's face it it's hard to change something like that because if your natural instinct is no it's not going to work or um to stop take a step back and force yourself to think of it no this will work whatever i mean that that takes an investment in yourself and and it's not even a significant one initially you can you know when someone says to you here are the reasons why not so, mm -hmm. so I know, so acknowledge that, okay, but tell me if it were working, what would we do? Right. Tell me exactly. how we can deliver on this. So it, that, you know, again, your brain cannot not answer a question. Sometimes though, we've got to ask twice to get over that instinctual immediate response. So when you say, so your brain cannot not answer a question, right? Mm -hmm. So explain that a little more. Well, you you are you're trained and you are set up to respond. And these days, as you've mentioned, speed pushes us to respond even more quickly. We, mm -hmm. we are physically shortcutting a lot of our thinking process and just going from data to action, data to action. Mm -hmm. And there are actually quite a few steps underneath that that would make a lot more sense for us to go through, um, unless we were in an emergency or urgent sure. situation, of course. So it's an interesting thing that we are we are just sort of wired from a very early age. We could change it, but we are from practice wired to respond immediately to questions. Mm. So we've got, again, very deep neural pathways around doing that. We're good at doing it. And our immediate response is almost always why it won't, why it can't, why it doesn't, mm. why it's not my fault, blah, blah, blah. So, so part of it then is obviously like if somebody asks you a question, maybe is to actually take a moment to think about the question rather than answer. Because I do think instinctively you answer, uh, you're correct. And it takes, I'll tell you, one of, one of the examples I often use is, um, you know, what they do in, in couples therapy is good therapists. You know, when one person speaks and the other person has to listen and not just re they not just repeat back what they said, but they can't move on until the person who initially said it is says yes, that's exactly what I meant, and yeah. that is and it's and it's a really tough thing to do, right? But to your point, it's exactly because we're so wired, we want to we want to answer and we want to give our opinion immediately, right? That we're we almost don't listen to that we almost don't listen to what's behind the question. Yeah, and oftentimes we are so busy preparing our response when you're yeah. speaking. You know, active listening is a skill that has diminished dramatically in the last mm -hmm. decade. Yeah, um, and active listening is a developmentally difficult skill set, so it takes practice to do it well. And um, unfortunately, most of the world is just you know run, 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 run. No matter what, just run. Speed trumps mm -hmm. everything. Yeah, that's unfortunate. It's very true. So what are some of the other elements to this? Um, it, well, <laughs> understanding what gets you to your behaviors is really crucial. And really beginning to think about what's getting your client or potential client to their decision points or their behaviors. We, we have um, thousands of biases, assumptions, and beliefs, mm -hmm. all of us in our head, formed from very early in our life. Um, and we tend to hold on to those for dear life. Even when there's a preponderance of data suggesting we should change them, we really hold on to those mental models, or we call them thought bubbles. It's just mm -hmm. a little easier to picture that sort of bubble over your head, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so understanding what's triggering those in yourself and trying to get underneath and really expose the thinking process of your client or potential client. There are language starters that are very helpful for doing that. Help me understand. Walk me through your thinking. What data mm -hmm. are you using to make this decision? What does that data mean to you? Why do you believe that it means that, etc.? So there are a lot of sentence prompts or starters that we can use to kind of get into someone's head a bit. And things they may not even know they were thunking, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, to I, help people, well, that's slowing it down. I always say those those prompts will slow a conversation down thirty seconds, and it will feel like you're trying to jog through quicksand. That's crucial. 
Yeah, and what it does is um, what you've outlined there is it it forces you to put, as you said, your biases or your assumptions aside for a moment. Because if I say to you, okay, well, you know, walk me through your thinking on this, right? I can't make assumptions because I don't know how you came up with that, right? I don't know what your thinking is. So I have to park my assumptions and biases for a moment to to actually put myself in your shoes and listen to what you have to say. And that's insanely hard for us to do. We mm -hmm. have a mental model or a, a thought bubble that we know more about what people are thinking than we really do. We, we also yeah. think, you know, people understand what we're saying, et cetera. So, so this is, it's really insanely complex. And yet there are some simple processes we can use to prompt ourselves to just take a breath, slow down. And, you know, one of the best prompts in the world is what if I'm wrong? Mm. What if we have the same data, but the data means something different to you than it does to me? Mm. What if there's something I don't know about this? What if, you know, the what if are the two most powerful words in the English language to prompt our brain very quickly. And when you say that to your brain, then, right, what happens? Your brain starts to sort of put aside some of your assumptions and sort of go, okay, hang on a second. It, it should. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sometimes it takes a couple of prompts because we're so pre-programmed to just run. Mm -hmm. But those what if prompts, remember, we can't not not answer a question. Mm -hmm. And so by using those for ourselves, it, you know, it may insert two or three seconds into our thinking process, but it expands it. And that's what we should always be trying to do, particularly when we're trying to influence, negotiate, or convince other people. We want to expand our thinking process. The more we do that, the more likely it is we're gonna find commonality between us and I'm gonna be able to understand and meet your needs. Yeah, and, and I think that's, uh, and I think it all comes back to, doesn't it? I mean, the fact is of just disciplining yourself to have some conversations with yourself, right? Um, as opposed to always like just immediately talking to the other person is maybe have a little bit of internal dialogue, dialogue before you speak. Yeah, I call it being an observing participant of self. So think about what you're thinking about. Mm -hmm. When you feel especially strongly about something, boy, that's a great cue. Pause. Wait a minute. What data do I have? Why do I believe this? What's leading me to this? And you'll be surprised initially in particular, it is very, very hard to put our thumb on the data that's leading mm -hmm. us to strong feelings, beliefs, or decisions. Yeah, I heard somebody recently who has a has a model um, that they use for it's a completely different uh, industry or whatever, but it's it's where they say, okay, if you think, if you assume something, then you go, as you just said, you have to ask yourself, is what what evidence do I have to actually back that up? And if you don't have any, you just say, okay, well then, what would make it different? If it's not true, how would it be different? How would I act differently, right? So you're trying to Same deconstruct your prompting your brain. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Prompting we, your brain the, to think the brain, differently. The brain will not live with a void of information on what's called our ladder of inference, which is the process from data to action or behavior. Mm -hmm. And there are numerous steps that are in between. And so when there is a void of information, we we call it MSU. We make shit up. We're incredible <laughs> at it. We do it instantaneously. The MSU is nine times out of 10 much more negative than the truth. Mm -hmm. So it's that, oh my gosh, my boss didn't smile at me in the hallway. I knew I was losing my job. He was always out to get me. And now right. I work very hard. Once I have that thought, I work very hard to prove myself right. Yeah. So I screen in data that supports it and I screen out data that negates it. Yeah, no, it's pretty true. It's like uh, it, it's like you render you render the guilty verdict, and then you go around looking for the evidence to back yeah. it up, right? <laughs> I, you know, one of the the mantras I have in my clients: we are better at proving ourselves right than anything else we do. Ah, As adult humans, big... we are incredible at proving ourselves right. We're spending the vast majority of our time proving ourselves right. Yeah, I, I know that's very, very true. And it's a great thing. It's a great takeaway for people is to try and, is to maybe start to catch yourself doing that because you're correct. I mean, we always want to be right all of the time. And uh, and sometimes we even believe we are. Uh, and, <laughs> <laughs> even even when the evidence is overwhelmingly against that. <laughs> Our brain is God. Even if it's 1% of the data, 
we're going to ignore that 99 and hold on to, right? Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> and the language that w- that evidences that is, don't you think, isn't it true? It's obvious yeah. that, shouldn't we? So uh, if you start listening to conversations, you will recognize pretty quickly that the vast majority of time people start talking, they're proving themselves right. They're not asking a question. <laughs> they're not really interested. They're yeah. busy proving themselves right, but it masquerades as a question. Don't yeah. you think? Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, exactly. Don't you think? Or 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 yes. However, <laughs> oh, what and however? Yes, those are big ones. Yes. Well, listen. I don't mean uh, to be disrespectful, or I don't mean sure. to disagree, but I'm about yeah, to. exactly. <laughs> With all due respect, yeah, I'm yeah. right and you're wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, listen, Holly. This has been fantastic. Uh, Holly's got a uh, is at a uh, doing a speaking at a sales conference today in Long Beach. Um, all of Holly's information and uh, links to her website and more information and her books and everything will be in her contributor bio. But before we go, Holly, do you want to tell people just a little bit more about yourself and how they can learn more? Um, the human biz is our website and there you'll find a lot of free tools and resources, more information, um, including, uh, my latest book called using your brain to win, which is, has about 33 neuro prompts in it. So different exercises and activities with your teams to to get clear on winning and to keep people aligned and in the same race. So I help companies, teams, and individuals be insanely more successful, what I'm really passionate about and um, where I spend my time. Excellent. Listen, then I encourage everybody to check out the book. Um, We'll have a link to it also in uh, Holly's uh, contributor bio. Listen, have a fantastic rest of your day in, in Long Beach, Holly. Thank you very much for joining us. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine and Pipeline and CRM. See you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you. Thank you.